All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to class today, and we are starting World War I and the pinnacle of American imperialism. So today we're going to transition from those experiments in imperialism with like the Spanish-American War out in Cuba and the Philippines and different things, and now the U.S. has gone full scale and ends up pulled into World War I. But we need to get a little bit of a background first on what's going on with World War I. So we start today with the road to World War I. It's important that we first understand something that's been going on uh, with the last several chapters that we've studied. There's a lot of repeated names and ideas, and there's a very important reason for that. So as we've talked and we trace back, we talked a little bit about imperialism last chapter. And the chapter before that, we talked about the Progressive Era. So just to backtrack, the Progressive Era takes place right around the turn of the 20th century, from about 1890 almost up to the 1920s. It spans a long period of time. The chapter that we studied after that imperialism is actually going on at exactly the same time. Progressive era is happening at home. Imperialism is happening abroad. And so those two things are happening at, at the same time. That's why in both chapters you heard names like Teddy Roosevelt and how in one moment he was president and you get into the next chapter and it's the Spanish-American War and before he was president. So it's, they're covering or overlapping the same time period. World War I comes in at the end of all of this and overlaps with both of these things at the end. It's right at the end of the era of, era of imperialism and right at the end of the progressive era as well. So repeated names and ideas and things like that, it's because a lot of these things that we've been studying over the last month or so, they do overlap in their time period. So all of these things are con concurring and happening at the same time. So getting into World War I, there are what we call four main causes of World War I. And if you remember back to world history, your world history teacher may have talked to you about this. You might remember it a little bit. Maybe it's a refresher from uh, a prior class. But these four main causes are what you need to remember when we talk about what actually set the stage for World War I. It creates an, an aura or a, a, just kind of an environment, of an atmosphere of tension, and it makes this, this whole idea of war very present in the minds of these countries in Europe and all it needs at that point after this is something to just light the fuse and we'll talk about what that is in a minute but let's start with the four main causes and main is going to become important and I'll explain why in just a moment cause number one is militarism of course the root to this word is military and so you can imagine what this is going to have to do with if it is is reminiscent of our good bold friend Alfred Thayer Mahan from imperialism who said the key to success in the world is to build up a strong military but the United States is not the only one who believes this and other countries will follow suit as well one thing that they do that the United States does not is something called conscription you can thank your lucky stars that we don't because what that means is that there is forced military service usually for all young men when they reach a certain age whether they are at war or not. That's the big difference between conscription and a draft. A draft happens during wartime to help supply the, war, the needs of the war. Conscription is kind of a permanent thing, and there are countries in the world now that conscript, that they make young men, when they turn a certain age, give a year, two years, or a certain amount of time to military service, and they serve their time, when they've completed that, they can return to civilian life, but everybody is required to give that time to the military. You can imagine when a country has conscription that you have a very big military, whether it's peacetime or, or, or at war, because every single young man is serving and enlisting. So you've got tons and tons of people in the military. And what that means, of course, is huge armies and you're also at the same time following in the in the idea of building up those artilleries. Remember, Alfred Thayer Mahan talked about shipbuilding and the importance of that to um, to a strong country. And then take into the consideration that a lot of countries use old military heroes that end up being leaders of the country, political leaders of the country. It's happened in the United States several times throughout our history, whether it's somebody like Ulysses S. Grant who becomes a uh, president after the Civil War. Uh, we have a, a history of doing that as well as other countries. And when military leaders rise to power and are faced with difficult decisions and things that they need to do, oftentimes they will solve those problems with, yep, you guessed it, military solutions and, uh, and war. And so there's a, a much greater tendency for them to be able to use war as a tactic to solve problems. 
So with these building up of all of these armies and navies and everything else like that, you've got these gigantic military forces that are just sitting there. And when they're just sitting there not being used, the temptation to use them is very great. Think of it this way. And I think we've used For example, you would not buy yourself this gorgeous multi-hundred thousand dollar sports car and put a cover on it, park it in the garage, and never ever take it out to drive. And if somebody asks to see it, say, hey, can I see your car? And you're like, no, that just stays in the garage. We don't really look at that. That's insane, right? If you had invested that much money and that much effort, you would, you would hopefully at least take it out for spin every once in a while. You would want to show people because well, you're kind of, that's kind of the point of it, right? Uh, you would want to take it out. Same thing with investing in your military. If you build up these gigantic this gigantic military and all these armed forces and everything else like that, and you spend lots of money on that, you're going to want to use it. And you're going to look for opportunities to roll it out and use it. It's just kind of the, the way that it is. The temptation, the same thing is true for these uh, countries at this time. And I said, uh, remind you, it's not just the United States that is buying into this. Germany is uh, going through the stage of militarism, um, as is Great Britain, France, many of these major European powers, Italy, and even Japan in the Far East, as well as the United States. So there's a lot of countries that are building up these militaries ready to fight. Clause number two for uh, World War One is alliances. Now alliances, you know what alliances are. Those are, are friendships or mutual relationships among countries where they basically make the agreement that, hey, anything happens, we got your back, we'll back you up. And it's an agreement between those countries to stand up for one another, and help each other out. Well, this can definitely be a good thing if you happen to pick the fight and that fight happens to be with somebody that is a little bit more powerful than you or a little bit bigger than you. There's also some downsides to alliances though too. So say one of your allies picks a fight, and that means that now, okay, you're kind of drawn into that, and you also have to join that fight. You may not want to. You may not want to be, be in anything involved with that, but because they're your ally, because you made an agreement, now you're kind of stuck. So there's two sides to alliances, um, the good and the bad there. There are two major alliances that have formed in Europe at the time. The first is called the Central Powers. This includes Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And another opposing alliance has joined together, the allies, which are France, Great Britain, and Russia. Now what you'll note from this group is that there's somebody notably missing. That's the United States. We're not entangled in any of these alliances at this point, which is what's going to allow the U.S. to stay out of the war, at least at the beginning, because uh, they don't feel like they need to be loyal to either particular side. We'll get more on why alliances play a huge role, especially at the beginning of World War I. The third ca cause of World War I is imperialism. And this you, you should already know a lot about because we just studied um, United States imperialism and the effects of that. So you should be able to give a pretty good definition of what imperialism is. Hopefully it, it sounds a little something like this. Strong nations trying to exercise political, social, or economic control over weaker nations. We've seen it take place with the United States as we've studied American imperialism, whether it's in Alaska, Hawaii, Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam, all of those places. We've seen American imperialism at work. Um, but what happens is we're not the only imperialist, obviously. There are other countries, some of those countries we just mentioned with big militaries, there are other countries that are trying to do the same thing. And we've used the example before of Africa. Africa is carved up like a like a pie all right different countries have their influence all over africa and are fighting for some of the same land and territory well the problem is is that you can fight over land and territory everybody can make their claims and everything like that but eventually good land and resources are going to run out or they're going to become very scarce and when they do you've got a few imperialistic co uh, countries that are, end up fighting over the territories that are left and it might be something like everyone trying to fight over that last piece of pumpkin pie after Thanksgiving. Only one piece left, only one slice left. Everybody wants claim on it. And so when that happens, the biggest or the strongest will survive social Darwinism, right? This whole idea that this big imperialist power will dominate, but others will be left with the pie in the face. In other words, they'll come up short. So which do you want to be? 
If you're an imperialistic country, you know that you have to fight for everything that you get. But there's also the reality that if you're not the biggest dog out there, you may come up short. That's kind of some of that tension that's going on when the conquering that's happening through imperialism is taking place throughout the world among these imperialistic countries. Finally, our last cause of World War I is nationalism. Nationalism is best described as extreme pride in, or patriotism in one's own country. Emphasis on the extreme. That's the most important part uh, because it's not just regular patriotism. This is maybe taking it a step overboard and going a little bit too far. It's not just saying my country is great. It's saying my country is better than your country. Our people are superior to your people. And as soon as you start saying that, immediately we're talking about discrimination and racism and other kinds of uh, things like that. Social Darwinism is a fault in that as well. So it causes competition and rivalry between countries. And it's not saying that competition or rivalry could be bad, but then again, sometimes it can because rivalry can grow into hatred and discrimination and all those kinds of things. And it often does when we're talking about competition between countries. Now, what's a good example of this? Of maybe a rivalry or a competition that most of the time is okay, but sometimes turns a little bit bad? Yeah, pretty obvious to think of a good example of that, right? Intense rivalry that is fun, that's enjoyable, that we we all like to participate in, we take a lot of pride in. But at the same time, you guys know from from your own experience. But if you have any any knowledge about the history of this great rivalry, you'll know that there are times when people are just stupid, and things like cross a ridiculous line. Okay, where people get hurt and and things take place that should never take place, and you're like, like seriously, how old are we, right? So a good, intense rivalry, trash talking and all those kinds of things, we're good with that. That's funny. But there comes a point when a line is crossed and something just goes beyond what it should. That's kind of what nationalism is, is it's taking that pride in what, what one is and that rivalry and just maybe going a little bit too far with it and taking it just a bit too far, which often results in racism, discrimination and other things. You have that happening throughout Europe, countries that are beginning to develop that sense of nationalism and ethnic pride in what they uh, and who they are. And this, of course, only heightens tensions throughout Europe. So those are our four causes of World War I. And the, and the easy way to remember this is you think of them as the main causes of World War I. Main as in M-A-I-N. Militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Easy way to remember it as long as you can spell the word Maine correctly. But if you spell it like M-A-Y-N-E, you're not going to have much luck when you're trying to think about that on the test. You're like, what does the E stand for? I can't think what the E stands for. That's not going to work. So as long as you spell it right, M-A-I-N, that should be a hint to what it is exactly that you're trying to remember. Militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Those create an atmosphere of tension. Big militaries, alliance systems, imperialism where they're fighting over the same territories and nationalism gives a sense of extreme pride. Europe is a tense place to be. And all it's going to take is something to just send this whole thing into a tailspin and just kind of explode. One event to kind of trip this powder keg. And that is going to come next in uh, Bosnia. Bosnia, you got Bosnia and Serbia are both on this map. I'm going to talk about something that takes place in Syria. Well, in and of this dude here, this handsome fellow is Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He is the Prince of Austria. He is next in line to inherit the throne and is kind of a big deal, sort of like Mr. Scheer, right? So uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand as the prince of, of Austria-Hungary, is going to take a trip to Bosnia and Sarajevo because Austria-Hungary has just annexed, remember that vocabulary word from last chapter, it annexed um, Bosnia. So he's going to take a trip there to see the people, get to meet uh, a lot of the officials there and everything else like that. So as he trail, uh, travels to Sarajevo, uh, there's another player that's important here, and it's a group, uh, a Serbian nationalist group. There's nationalist, there's that word again. A Serbian nationalist group called the Black Hand. The Black Hand is a nationalist group with some pretty big ideas. Um, they are greatly opposed to the Austria-Hungarian throne because Serbians are very close ethnically and politically to Bosnians. And so 
they don't like Austria-Hungary, they don't like Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and they begin to hatch a plan to assassinate Franz Ferdinand, particularly when a great opportunity opens up when he's planning that visit to Sarajevo in 1914. He's going to come there. They think, hey, that's a great time to off him. We'll take care of all this. So, enter Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1914. If there's anything we have learned from many people in history, it is when given the opportunity to tour a place, you almost definitely want to do this in a closed top vehicle. Do not take the convertible. Too often that ends in the uh, untimely demise of so many great leaders. Instead, swallow your pride, put yourself in a covered vehicle, turn away from the, uh, the, the convertible, and things are probably going to turn out a lot better for you. But in this particular case, Archduke Franz Ferdinand does not want to do that. He wants to see the people of Sarajevo. He wants to look at them. And so therefore he says, nope, no closed top vehicle for me. That's probably a really bad choice for him. So what's going to happen is, and this is <clears throat> try to fast forward the story, but this is one of the craziest stories in all of history. So the Black Hand plans assassination when he takes his trip there, and they, they find out what his route is going to be through the city because they post it in the newspapers the day before. Great idea. Again, so they plan that they're going to line themselves. So there are seven assassins in total. They're going to line themselves down the road to different places. Some of them have grenades and have bombs and pistols and all kinds of things. And it's got like, we got like a plan A, we've got a plan B, we've got a plan C, we've got a plan D. We've got so many backup plans. Our backup plans have backup plans, all right? So they've got this whole thing correct, all, all kind of figured out. Now, a lot of these guys are young. They're real idealistic Serbian nationalists, young college age kids that want to change the world and everything else like that. And so uh, they're young guys. Uh, some of them are sick and are ill. A few of them have tuberculosis. They're essentially dying, nothing to lose kind of mentality, and they're ready to do this. So Archduke Franz Ferdinand begins his tour that day outside of the city and is traveling in. That's the street along which all these guys are lined up. And the greatest kind of thing happens. It gets to the first guy, the first guy, because, again, they're young and maybe not as, a, uh, as set in their ways. He sees him, and he gets nervous and decides he's not going to hold on. There are about two or three other people right down, about a block away down the road. Uh, two others see that he doesn't act, and they look at him like, oh. Crap, the other guy didn't act. What are we going to do? But one of the guys standing there, who is, by the way, dying of tuberculosis, really doesn't have much to lose. He's like, hey, man, I'm doing this. I want to be a hero. So he cracks his grenade, strikes the cap, and throws the grenade at the Archduke's car, and it rolls. But the assassin forgot to – or forgot the fact that the grenade had a 10-second delay on it. So it's thrown towards the car, hits the back of the car, kind of rolls around in the street a little bit and then eventually blows up the car behind it in the motorcade. So Archduke Franz Ferdinand is safe after this, although the people in the car behind him are not obviously in very good shape. Misses the target, failed botched assassination attempt, but the guy continues to follow through with the plan. The plan was they've each got a, bottle, a little vial of cyanide that they're supposed to take and drink the cyanide poison and kill them, and that way if they're captured, they won't talk, etc., etc., etc. So he takes his cyanide, but it turns out the cyanide that they had in their vials was really, really, really old, so it actually doesn't kill them, but it just makes them puke a whole lot. And so there he is, just kind of like thrown up on the street, and he's like, no, this isn't going to work, so he throws himself into the nearby river to drown himself so that he dies anyway. The problem was that the river, river this time of year was very, very low. In fact, it was only about four inches deep. So he tries to kill himself with the cyanide, tries to kill himself by throwing himself in the river. This was not a good day for this dude. All right. Uh, he had failed at assassinating the Archduke. Not good. Failed at killing himself once with the cyanide. Not good. Failed again to trying to kill himself by throwing himself in a river. Still not good. So there he is with vomit and sitting in four inches of water when the police come and pick him up and arrest him. So um, not so good for the second assassin. And to be honest, none of the rest of the assassins, because they they heard the bomb go off, they're shocked. They're like looking around like, Ugh. and then the car speeds up, and they're just still kind of in this state of shock as they watch the car speed by and don't do anything, uh, shoot their guns, throw any grenades, anything else like that. They're just kind of stuck. They're frozen. And so our plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, and so on and so forth, the black hand didn't pan out. But a bit of fortune works out. So they go – the Archduke goes off to the um, reception that he was supposed to go to. Uh, the the assassins kind of rendezvous at a predetermined meeting point to come back together and be like, hey, what the heck happened? The leader of the assassins is a guy by the name of Gavrilo Princip. And Princip is supposed to be the leader and supposed to be the one that if everybody else screwed up, he didn't screw up, but he did. So he's kind of ticked off. So he kind of walks off from the group, 
It's about lunchtime. It goes off to have a sandwich because, I mean, what do you do? Uh, you're not you when you're hungry, so you better uh, go get a sandwich. So the Archduke uh, goes to the reception, goes comes out of there, and he uh, he decides he wants to go visit the people in the hospital or the car behind him. So he takes a different route, but somebody forgets to tell the driver, so the driver has to turn around and pull into an alley. When he pulls into the alley, it just so happens to be that that alley goes back right beside a delicatessen, a nice sandwich shop, where Gavrilo Princip happens to be finishing up his lunch and walking out the door. As he's walking out the door to the deli where he just had a sandwich, what does he find right directly in front of him? Then the Archduke Franz Ferdinand's car right there. Fate had brought them together to one way or another. And Gabriel Prince is like, well, okay, all right, this worked out. So he walks up to the car, which by the way was stalled because as the uh, driver was trying to flip it into reverse, he grinded gears. And it's just sitting there. So Princip walks up to the car, shoots Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife right there on the spot, and they are dead. The assassin attempts to, he takes his cyanide, also old cyanide doesn't work, gets ready to shoot himself, uh, but police tackle him to the ground before he can. Finally, success. One of the assassins has succeeded in assassinating Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the prince of the Austro-Hungarian throne. Huge deal. As for Princip, who is pictured right there, he becomes sentenced to 20 years in prison because under uh, Serbian law, he was actually, he was 19 years old, but he was cons they're considered a minor in Serbian law at the time, so he can't be, um, can't be eligible for the death penalty. Of the other assassins that they eventually find out because their conspirators, conspirators face about 20 years in prison or the death penalty, depending on uh, who they were and what their age was, so they get... Uh, that punishment, which really doesn't seem like a whole lot, considering what is about to happen, because the effects of Gavrilo Princip's assassination echo in a huge way. As soon as he is assassinated, Austria-Hungary knows. They know that something has happened, and it has to do with Serbia. And so immediately they declare war on Serbia. Now, that should be it. End of story, right? And then we have the Austro-Hungarian-Serbian War of 1914, you know? something that nobody would ever really study or pay much attention to because it would be very probably short. Austria-Hungary would destroy them and it would be over. But that's not exactly how it plays out because Serbia has an ally. That ally is Russia. Russia is much, much bigger than Serbia and can offer quite a bit of support. So Russians then join the war and will fight with the Serbians against Austria-Hungary. Well, Germany happens to be an ally of Austria-Hungary, and so Germany's like, uh, uh we're declaring war on you, Russia, as well. And since Russia is also allies with France, we are also declaring war on France. Well, of course, you know that this isn't going to end everything right away. France is happens to be allies with Great Britain, so Great Britain declares war on the allies Germany and Austria-Hungary. So what possibly could have started as a war just between Austria and Hungary and Serbia, you know, basically started by one shot by Princip, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and it was over. Now it is ballooned into this war, European war at this point that is going to continue to expand into the Great War, or what we will eventually know as World War I that pulls more and more and more countries in through allyships and other things. So that's where it starts with our main causes, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism, which sets an environment or an atmosphere. And then that event that just takes all of that and touches it off. Any one of those things alone probably would not have resulted in World War I, but, with all of them combined, and then that one thing that just kind of just sort of tips it all in the right direction, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, then war begins to explode. And that's where we get World War I. Now, notably, the United States, completely on the other side of the ocean, not interested right now. Would rather just read about it in the newspaper than have any kind of participation in it. So our next, the next direction we'll go is what draws the U.S. into something that otherwise probably would not have had anything to do with it. So hopefully today you remember what the main causes of war is, the significance of that spark that uh, was provided by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and how we end up in World War One.